debate these topics. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. If I could say a, a few words to begin. First off, uh, thank you all for your patience uh, tonight. I did not know what time this was going to begin either. It's about uh, 3.15 a.m. in Moscow right now tonight. Uh, and I, I want to say one, one more thing uh, briefly, which is I understand there was a strike. I was not told that there was a strike that was happening uh, today. And this caused a lot of trouble uh, for all of you who are in line. Uh, but I'd like to ask you not to hold that against uh, the protesters. Because there's something that we need to remember that... Yeah. I understand things got heated, you know, words were exchanged, and this is the kind of thing that happens uh, in a democracy. We have uncertainties, we have difficulties, we have inconveniences, but these things are not a weakness, these things are a strength. And although, uh, again, I understand that these uh, individuals uh, may have caused difficulty, uh, it was for something that I think we can all agree they must have believed in very strongly. Uh, because it is very, very, very hard, and I know this better than most, to be the least popular person in the room, particularly when there are many more of the others than there are of you. Uh, so just because I, I can't take a position on their strike because I'm not familiar with the group, I didn't know anything about this, uh, I will say one thing that we can do to help is just uh, let everybody who's on the live stream uh, hear what you uh, in the audience have already, I think, had to confront, uh, which is the name of this group. I think it's the Association of McGill University Support Employees, uh, and I think they're trying to uh, get a fair wage or something like that. Uh, I'd encourage any of you who are connected or impacted by these employees, their groups, or their efforts uh, to please at least hear them out and go look at their materials. Uh, with, with that said, uh, let's get into it. Um, I'm not going to give you a whole preamble and go sort of through my background because I, I think, uh, again, you guys have been waiting in line this long. We already know it. Um, but one of the central questions is, you know, why did I come forward? Why does it matter? Uh, and how does this impact the way we're living now? And I, I think the central nexus that's affecting everybody the most uh, right now, particularly in this current moment of news, is the fact that we're all being watched. Right, regardless of whether we're doing anything right or wrong. Uh, and this is a fundamental change, and this is what drove me forward. Traditionally, the work of intelligence services, uh, the work of surveillance agencies, of police investigators, had always been particularly and specifically targeted towards individuals who we had probable cause that had been demonstrated to a court were up to no good foreign spies, you know, military units uh, from adversarial nations. Uh, these were the guys that we were watching. But with the rise of the internet, right, uh, advances in our, our science, our understanding of math, uh, the way things are tied together, the communications network, and the way it has sort of swallowed the earth, radically changed the dynamic. Now, surveillance technologies have outpaced democratic controls. Those things that we used to enjoy a, a generation ago uh, were primarily the product of one particular uh, technological peculiarity, which is that surveillance was expensive, extremely so. Governments had to spend extraordinary sums to track individuals. To know someone's location might involve many teams of officers, uh, both in buildings, uh, behind desks, and those out on the street, Next. working in shifts. Uh, I apologize. We, we've got somebody who just joined this stream. Uh, I'm not sure if the university added this, but <laughs> it was causing a little echo. All right, we've got that fixed, I think. Uh, yeah, but so we had... Uh, basically this dynamic where you had to have whole groups of people 
tracking one individual. But now, thanks to this rise in technology, that has been reversed entirely. Uh, now you can have one guy sitting somewhere completely far away from the target, like myself at the NSA in Hawaii, who can track with extreme precision an unimaginably large number of people. Rather than having whole teams following one person, now you have one person following whole groups, whole individuals. And they don't have to be connected in any way. And this means for the first time in human history, it's both technologically and financially feasible for governments to track and store nearly complete records of all of our lives. And this is not science fiction. This is happening now. This, not a black screen, this is uh, the Massive Data Repository. Uh, the NSA constructed this in Bluffdale, Arizona. It's since been renamed uh, to the Mission Data Repository because I think they presumed that Massive Data Repository probably wasn't the best branding anymore. In, in the wake of the things we learned in 2013. Uh, but what does this represent? This represents that shift in dynamic. Now, we never knew what this facility was doing. We never knew why it was created. Governments have not asked for the permission of the public in order to engage in these kind of operations. Instead, it deployed these kind of capabilities in secret, even when they knew these programs were unlawful, or unconstitutional, or perhaps even because they knew this. And this effort has enabled, has been enabled because of failures in our intended mechanisms for constitutional oversight of our sort of democratic societies. Uh, courts were unwilling to permit legal challenges uh, against the activities of these spy agencies because they said they were speculation. They could say, well, you can't prove you were spied on because it's classified. You don't have access to documents or records. Therefore, we, the courts, even though this could be a violation of your rights or the rights of everyone in, in the uh, country, don't have a place in this debate because first you have to establish the facts. Uh, we had a Congress in the United States that knowingly permitted national security officials to brazenly lie to the public without consequence uh, or even correcting the record. Uh, this is a senator in the United States uh, who is questioning the most senior intelligence official uh, in the United States, General uh, James Clapper, the director of national intelligence. Uh, and it is a felony to give uh, false testimony uh, when you are sworn under oath. Uh, but that is exactly what happened in 2013, three months before I came forward. Does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not. Not wittingly. There are cases where they could in inadvertently perhaps uh, collect but not, not wittingly. Unfortunately, that was not true. Uh, and this brings us to consider sort of, where does this leave us? Because at the time that happened, the public had no idea it was a lie. The senator asking the question did know it was a lie. The uh, director of national intelligence knew that it was a lie as well. <laughs> Apologize, we've got someone else who's joined the stream. Uh, all right, hopefully the university can get that under control. Um, but the thing here is all the powerful people in the room uh, knew this was a lie, but they didn't correct the record. They allowed the public to be deceived, even though it was, in fact, a crime. The director of national intelligence later admitted uh, this was a false statement, saying it was what he considered the least untruthful thing he could say at the time and too cute by half. But what does it mean in a democracy where the very foundation of the government, uh, the legitimacy of our system is derived from the idea that we, when we cast our votes, are providing consent for the government to carry out these policies. Consent, as hopefully everyone in this room can tell you, is only meaningful if it is informed. <laughs> I get the feeling that, that we have a live stream somewhere that is uh, displaying things that uh, are allowing people to join. But I hope that all of you who are joining will at least mute your microphones. Uh, 
Thank you so much, those who did join me. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, <laughs> whoever is uh, managing the AV, if you could hide that URL, that'd be helpful, although I think it's probably too late for tonight. So let's just try to push through it. Uh, Okay, well, look, guys, let, let's, let's simplify this. Let's make this a little more casual, uh, and hopefully we can regain a little bit more time from the university here, since I know you guys waited a long time for this tonight. Uh, and, and just make it a little bit more casual, because, again, uh, nobody likes speeches, right? Um, we're facing a big problem today, right? Uh, we have powerful political forces that are asking for more and more power, more and more authority. Uh, they say we're facing a time of extraordinary threat. There are now lone individuals, uh, these kind of super criminals, right, like terrorists, uh, spies, and things like that, uh, who are totally capable of destabilizing uh, our entire societies, uh, ending our governments, collapsing our states. Now, there's no real evidence that that's actually the case, uh, but the politics of this fear uh, have really reshaped the way that our laws are being passed. So we have to figure out how do we maintain a free society in the context of an unlimited government? Uh, this we've seen in Canada through bills such as C-51 and so on and so forth. Uh, the United States, uh, of course, we had the birth of mass surveillance uh, on a truly global scale. Uh, the UK is now passing what they call the Investigatory Powers Bill, which is really an unrestrained uh, an unprecedented intrusion into the private lives of every citizen, not only uh, in their country, but everywhere else. Uh, when, we, when the government is presuming a trust in the propriety of their actions that no longer exists, this story about the Montreal police uh, spying on a journalist through their phone uh, in a very intense way for the particular reason, a specified reason, of uncovering the sources behind their journalism uh, is a radical attack on the operations of the free press. Uh, and speaking as uh, one of the directors of the Freedom of the Press Foundation, uh, this unsettles me not only on a personal level, uh, but I think is something that actually represents a threat to the traditional model of our democracy. Can we recognize, or at least debate in a reasoned way, a new idea which is somewhat radical, which is that law is beginning to fail as a guarantor of our rights. It is the lowest bar uh, protecting the way we operate, the intera interact with one another, because government has built in uh, so many mechanisms to get around these things, uh, these restrictions, when it wants to, that now the local police can decide that they don't like a journalist's reporting. They can go to a justice of the peace, and the justice of the peace will quite happily say, okay, that sounds great. Look at the GPS on his phone. Figure out everywhere he's traveling. Figure out everyone he's communicating with. No, you can't actually read his emails. No, you can't actually listen to his calls. But you can find out everyone he met with, who he called, how long he was on the call with. Uh, and from this, derive uh, an extraordinary understanding of how this individual works. And it wasn't just one. It's now expanding. We're hearing six, maybe possibly more. And rather than the police chief, saying, all right, this was clearly something that went too far, and regardless of whether or not I authorized this operation, I recognize that to restore trust, uh, I need to reestablish the basis of accountability, that accountability that is lost when our operations become secret. And for that reason, I have chosen to resign. Uh, we don't see the mayor calling for that. We don't see the local premier calling for that. And it's this question, this dynamic, where our governments are increasingly invested with extraordinary capabilities to peer into all of our private lives uh, with very little interference, whereas we, the public, can know almost nothing about how they operate. This inverts the traditional dynamic of private citizens and public officials into this brave new world we're facing of private officials and public citizens.
So thank you so much for that. And actually, I think this is really great because um, over the last couple of weeks, I was able to get a lot of really amazing questions. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to ask one or two questions, and then we'll also take questions from the audience. So I'm going to start with a question from Vincent uh, Prager, Prager, who's a member of Media at McGill uh, Board of Trustees. And he's quite interested in ethics and journalism. And so this is how the question is oriented. Given your status of a fugitive in the eyes of the United States government, what ethical considerations and or restrictions should guide the media in the United States and elsewhere around the world in reporting on you and your story? Are there different ethical guidelines from country to country? What is your level of satisfaction with such reporting on your story, and has it been equally fair from country to country? So it's a nice kind of comparative media question. So take it away. Uh, so one of the things that I've tried to be very careful about uh, since uh, June of 2013, when I first came forward, was not telling the media how to do their job. Um, I worked very hard uh, to make sure that I wasn't in the decision loop, uh, that I didn't say what was published or not. In fact, this is something that not everyone understands, but the number of documents that I published, uh, that I made publicly available, uh, has been zero. Instead, I gathered uh, inside the NSA what I believe to be evidence uh, of criminal activity within the government. Uh, and this wasn't just in the United States government. This was the Five Eyes Surveillance Alliance, right? Uh, this is a transnational spying group. Uh, consisting of the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Uh, and this is, of course, why we have some understanding now of what was actually going on uh, behind the curtain uh, in Canada about the operations of their uh, sort of surveillance uh, context. And that is, uh, excuse me while I try to find the uh, reference for this here. Um, something that has actually been established in the wake of 2013 with uh, more scrutiny, that Canada ha actually has the weakest intelligence oversight out of any major Western country. Uh, this was something that people didn't really expect. Now, they're not the most aggressive uh, of all countries. They don't have the largest scale. Uh, but no one's really watching. Uh, there is no real parliamentary understanding of what's happening uh, behind the door. And this is what allowed them to engage in massive sort of indiscriminate surveillance. Uh, dragnet surveillance that was affecting millions of Canadians, uh, that was targeting, for example, the app stores uh, that you might connect to with your phones, uh, things that have now been published and we can now debate, but prior to these disclosures, we didn't really know, right? But here's the idea behind this comparative media question. This was my belief, that these things were violations of human rights, uh, of written statutory laws uh, or our basic constitutional principles. But what if I was wrong? What if I was sort of this crazy radical and I had been in my head so long, you know, working in these intelligence places, uh, talking to my coworkers, that I just didn't have a full understanding. Maybe I, I didn't see the big picture. If I published these things on my own, I believe there was a somewhat larger risk, a greater risk, uh, that I would go too far. And so because of this, uh, I chose instead to replicate the system of checks and balances in our government that had unfortunately failed over time uh, to try to restore that balance. And the way that I wanted to check myself was to instead provide this archive of documents to journalists uh, who would then be required by virtue of gaining access uh, to this archive uh, to make an independent judgment in every case for every story, not that it was newsy, not that it was interesting, not that it was just a sexy story, but it was actually in the public interest to know uh, about the details of this operation or that operation, uh, why it mattered, what was going on, and how it was being accomplished, uh, and what this meant for our rights. Uh, now, beyond this, as an additional safeguard uh, to mitigate risks, uh, I wanted 
these journalists to then go to the governments uh, who are actually carrying out these operations in each case uh, to allow the government a chance to argue that they didn't understand these stories, that maybe they had gotten the calculus wrong. Uh, maybe there was some detail, some sentence in the story that would actually put a human life at risk just because it was like the, you know, something that a journalist might not recognize, like the employee number of uh, somebody that's a cafeteria worker overseas, but might actually be an intelligence source who could be uh, recognized by these documents. And in every case, this was followed, right? The government didn't get a veto. They couldn't say you can't publish these stories. Uh, but they could say, look, this is dangerous or it's not. Uh, and this is why in 2016, I believe, the government has never been able to show a single case, credible or incredible, of any evidence that indicates anybody came to harm as a result of this reporting. Uh, now, there's a second dynamic of this, this question, which is, screw the NSA, screw the reporting, screw all the uh, actual stuff that's going on uh, about the surveillance operations, and what's going on with me? Are people being fair to me? Are they covering this way or that way? Are some countries doing better? Are some countries doing worse? And of course, this is the case. Uh, we have seen in the majority of countries that are not the United States, uh, they've done public polling opinion, uh, and pretty much universally, people have a positive opinion of what I did. The United States government, of course, uh, has been running a very active smear campaign uh, to reduce the level of support uh, for my arguments uh, and for this journalism ever since uh, 2013. And it has been to some extent effective, uh, not fully actually. There's a surprising amount of support. The three largest human rights groups in the world, uh, the ACLU or the three leading groups, uh, the American Civil Liberties Union, Amnesty International, and Human Rights Watch are now actually petitioning the President of the United States to drop uh, what the media calls his war on whistleblowers. But here's the central idea there from my perspective. It doesn't actually matter what people say about me. I am the least important part of this story. And if you're thinking about sort of uh, me, uh, what's happening to me, what my futures look like, uh, you're missing the larger question, which is what happens to all of us. Uh, well, thank you for that very thoughtful question. Uh, what I'm going to do now is ask one more question, and then already people are lining up. Um, or they're just sitting on the stairs. So line up if you have some questions. <laughs> All right, so I'm really um, actually excited about this question. It's by one of my students, Aaron Gluck Thayer, who, like Snowden, is very much uh, passionate about these issues. He's an engineering student here at McGill. And I'm just gonna uh, read it, because he wrote it very uh, carefully. He says, it's clear that intelligence agencies interpret their legal mandate expansively. Michael Hyden, the former director of the NSA, famously said, quote, give me the box you will allow me to operate in. I'm going to play to the very edges of that box. I will play very aggressively in it. Canada's Foreign Intelligence Agency, CSE, is similar. By exploiting the uncertainty in the legal definition of metadata, it can, quote, incidentally collect troves of personal data on Canadians. Canadian Domestic intelligence agency CSIS also operates under a similar culture. And he gives another example and then goes on to say, under Bill C-51, CSIS's expansive capabilities were broadened even further. The only limits to their new and vague disruption powers are that CSIS cannot willfully obstruct justice, cause bodily harm, or violate sexual integrity. I promise this is the only very detailed question like this. So there seems to be a culture in intelligence agencies of working the law to their purposes and pushing the law to its boundaries. Intelligence agencies don't ask what their surveillance practices should be. Rather, they ask what their surveillance practices are allowed to be. And then he says, this can create the appearance of lawfulness, which the government points to whenever the activities of intelligence agencies are challenged by the public. But all it does is subvert the law. So here's the question. 
How do we ensure that intelligence agencies interpret the law not just narrowly, but in a way that is reconcilable with what the public reasonably expects? When reforming our intelligence agencies, do we have to abandon the premise that intelligence agencies are committed to following the law in a reasonable way? Uh, so this is a great question. It's a very complex question. Uh, one of the interesting things is uh, you, uh, the, the question quoted Michael Hayden, uh, former director of both the NSA and the CIA, uh, which is a little bit of a mistake uh, because, of course, if you're the head of the CIA and the NSA, you are literally a professional liar. Uh, deception is sort of your business. So he has a little bit of a checkered history because he says, uh, you know, give me the, the lines of the box and I'll, I'll play to the edge. Uh, I'll get chalk on my cleats, but I won't leave the field of play. Unfortunately, we have documentary proof that that's not the case. Uh, he was actually asked uh, as director of the NSA in the post 9-11 period uh, by the president of the United States through the vice president's lawyer, uh, would he basically violate the law? Uh, there was a controversy where the attorney general of the United States said that the NSA's operations were unlawful. Uh, they could not be performed consistently with the authorities that were provided uh, under the Constitution. Uh, or statutes that had been passed authorizing their operations. Uh, and the president came to him through these proxies and said, would you go ahead and continue spying on everyone anyway, even if the attorney general is against it? And he said, yes. Uh, and this is not, you know, this is not to beat up him specifically because he's not so important. He's just one of a long line of officials that do the same thing, as you mentioned, it happens across borders, it happens across uh, cultures, it happens across languages. Uh, you're kidding yourself if you think intelligence officials in France, Germany, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, you know, Brazil, India, aren't doing the same thing. Uh, this is how they operate. So this means the central premise of that question, how do we trust and ensure that we can trust these intelligence agencies uh, and officials to interpret the law fairly, to operate fairly? And the answer is you can. But what you can do is put processes and instructions in place where you don't have to. And this leads us to kind of the failings of C-51 uh, and the larger problem uh, of Canada's intelligence apparatus where there is no oversight that's meaningful. Uh, there are three main problems, uh, fundamental problems with C-51, uh, which the current Prime Minister of Canada, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, did campaign uh, to reform and unfortunately has not done so. Uh, most experts who have studied this bill say it actually can't be reformed in a meaningful way. As written, it should be repealed entirely uh, and then a better uh, measure passed from scratch uh, that loses all the baggage. But first off, there's no meaningful oversight there, right? What would be meaningful oversight? How do you ensure uh, that you don't have to trust these intelligence officers? And the way you do that uh, is you appoint a judicial body, uh, some mechanism, some structure, some commission that has independent prosecutorial authority that is mandated to perform a case-by-case -case review of these intelligence agencies, these police agencies, their use of powers, exceptional powers, after the fact of investigation to ensure that no illegalities occurred. And if they did occur, they can then prosecute on this basis. The only thing that will ensure that these intelligence agencies uh, or police agencies or even corporations as they gain access to these kind of mass surveillance capabilities uh, play fairly is the threat of criminal sanction. Now, this means basically you don't get in the way of the intelligence services uh, saying, look, you've got to go you know, do all of these things before you investigate uh, this person or that person, before you pull the email of someone that you suspect is a terrorist. But you must know that in every case, we're going to have a judge and a prosecutor going through your decisions uh, after the fact. And if you did break the law, uh, you will be held to a, the account of our laws in that case. Uh, the second thing is sharing without necessi necessity, transparency, or accountability right. Uh, Canada's services can now 
make available all of the different uh, information that they hold about you. And this can be things such as your health records, right? It doesn't have to actually be anything spooky. Uh, they can now be traded amongst agencies, even if you're not related to some real uh, terroristic threat or anything like that. Uh, it's not very well limited. Uh, and then there's this larger question of the criminalization of speech, right? Uh, we already see that spying authorizations, uh, legal authorizations, sorry, that weren't intended to be used for uh, spying in this context or for surveilling people who are not terrorists uh, or real criminal threats, violent threats, threats to life, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, are instead being used, repurposed for monitoring terrorists and things like, or <laughs> monitoring terrorists, forgive me, uh, monitoring journalists who are not the same as terrorists, uh, despite what the GCHQ says. Unless you work at an intelligence agency, in case you might be worried about that. But uh, the idea here is, let's take that example uh, of the Canadian journalists who have been spied on by the Montreal police. We have the news story saying that what happened, but we still don't actually know under what legal authority it occurred. There is a uh, suspicion that this was actually done under uh, Bill C-13, correct me if I'm wrong, fact check me audience, uh, that was actually intended to be passed as a cyber bullying law. That's how it was branded. Was that actually being used to collect the communication of journalists? Was C-51 involved? Were any of these other legal authorities involved? We don't know because we have no idea what the government is actually doing underneath uh, that curtain. And that is not just a risk, uh, that is a fundamental danger to the stability of any open and liberal society. Suddenly, we have a set of rules for all of you in the audience. There's a set of rules that can get whistleblowers uh, and journalists charged and investigated by police. But what about when police break the law? What about when spies break the law? Suddenly, they're being held to a very different legal standard uh, and they're entitled to a, a veil of secrecy uh, that inoculates them against criticism and scrutiny that the rest of us do not enjoy. That is an imbalance of power uh, that is not only, I would say, um, unwise, but is actually anti-democratic. It is authoritarian in nature. So go ahead and um, try, unlike what I just did, uh, keep the question a bit short so we can get to others. No? Okay. Um, Forgive me to be clear, I am not getting that audio, uh, audio at all, so if I could ask uh, Gabrielle if you could repeat that for me. Um, now, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay. Perfect. Um, so my question is that knowing that most of those surveillance decisions are made on the political level, do you have any comments on the current presidential elections in the United States? So this is a complicated question for me because everybody's like, you know, who should I vote for? Who should I vote for? Uh, what do you think? Um, and the reality here is there are two reasons that I never answer this question. Uh, one is if you have to ask other people, you're not really appreciating the burden and the value of your opinion, your perspective in the operation of our democracy. Uh, don't look to others to tell you who to vote for. Look to you. Uh, read about these things. Listen to the conversation. Make a determination for yourself. Uh, the second thing here is, as a privacy advocate, uh, the decision of who you vote for right, uh, is something you should never be made to answer. Um, and so I try to set a good example there in not responding. What I will say uh, is that I think it's very disappointing uh, in the long history of American democracy, uh, where we are, if nothing else, a very successful country, uh, 
that we are going through an entire election cycle where all we hear about are the personalities of these uh, candidates, the insults that they throw each other. But we hear very little about the Constitution. And this reminds me of a mistake that I made during the last sort of change of power in the United States, from the Bush administration to the Obama administration. He was a president who campaigned on the idea of ending the worst excesses of the Bush uh, administration. He promised to hold officials who had broken the law, who had engaged in torture and so on and so forth, uh, to account, uh, to do investigations, to hold trials. But as soon as he took office, uh, he abandoned that promise, saying we need to look forward, not backwards. But every investigation is necessarily retrospective looking. And if you say that there can never be a look backwards at official crimes, what you're saying is that there can be no accountability for official crimes. He said he would end warrantless wiretapping. We weren't going to do that anymore. And in fact, uh, he expanded it uh, and institutionalized it uh, in many ways. These are disappointing things. But when he came to take office, because he claimed these things, I believe that they would happen. I took him at his word. And many others did. You know. This is not to say it's a, a terrible thing to have faith uh, in officials and uh, belief in the power of hope. But I think we all need to recognize that we should be extraordinarily cautious about putting all of our hopes on political candidates, on elected officials. Because if we look at history, their promises very rarely uh, equate to their products. And while you may pr appreciate uh, one candidate above the other, the ultimate answer to democracy here is that we cannot rely on others to do the things that we must do for ourselves. And ultimately, if you want to build a better country, you're going to have to do it yourself. So we're going to take a question on this side. I'm going to pose one more question, and then we'll go to you. Do you, hear, do you hear me? I can. Thank you. Okay. My question is, are there any circumstances under which it is fair for a country to engage in mass surveillance of its people? I think this would be uh, an argument of utilitarianism, right? Uh, do the ends justify the means uh, as long as they're beneficial? Uh, this ultimately gets to the question of efficacy. Uh, so we have a lot of evidence that mass surveillance uh, is actually not very effective. Uh, in the United States, uh, for example, uh, in the wake of 2013, we had two independent presidential commissions appointed to investigate the claims that have been made by journalists. Uh, these are staffed with White House allies, right? Not radical hippie reformists or anything like that. Uh, they included officials such as the former deputy director of the CIA, so not exactly what you would consider to be friends of civil liberties. And yet, despite having full access to classified information, being able to walk into the FBI, the NSA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and all of these other areas uh, that are involved in the spying, and saying, tell us what's going on, and having the clearances to actually see it, they could not identify a single instance uh, in which the kind of mass surveillance represented by uh, the warrantless wiretapping, the telephony metadata program happening in the US, uh, basically collecting the call records of everybody uh, in the way that the Met, uh, Montreal police were using against this journalist, uh, but on a much broader scale, had never actually resulted in a positive benefit. Uh, it had never made a concrete difference in the outcome of any terrorism investigation. Uh, moreover, it had never even contributed to the discovery of an unknown plot. But what if it had? This is very similar to arguing, what if torture were effective? Uh, what if extrajudicial murder uh, were effective, right? We're talking about assassinations here. What if slavery were a wonderful economic program? It wouldn't make it right. We have human rights for a reason, right? Uh, and we protect these things. And these are uh, policies that are promoted by these same governments. The United States, uh, of course, put forth the Universal Declaration of Human Rights with the UN, uh, which guarantees a right 
from the arbitrary interference in your private communications, right? It forbids mass surveillance. So I would argue uh, it's not a question uh, of can this thing be justified in terms of efficacy or whatever. Uh, it's do we want to live in a world without human rights? So I'm going to switch uh, the gears a little bit and ask a question from a PhD student, Isadora Borges uh, Monroy, who's in my class on computer hackers. And we actually all went to see the Snowden film uh, this fall, and, and most of us have also seen Citizen Four. And Snowden, I think you're absolutely right that the important issues are the issues and not the person, but the person has become uh, fodder for Hollywood. And uh, Oliver Stone did present the issues um, in some very interesting ways, and this is a great way to reach different publics. And so she had a question which I've actually thought quite a bit about, because in the movie, uh, a bunch of the other techies working at the NSA had reservations like you. So uh, she's asking whether you know, this is actually accurate. And it is striking that while in some ways you are the most famous whistleblower, there have been others such as uh, William Binney and Thomas Drake who have sounded the whistle. So um, we would just like to hear a little bit more about the kind of work culture at the NSA or the, the contracting uh, corporations and how people kind of express their dissatisfaction or whether you kind of thought of the problems in a kind of siloed way and then just acted independently. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. I, I brought my concerns to a, a lot of my different colleagues. Uh, I brought them to supervisors. I showed them specifically uh, this slide uh, amongst others. It was actually not a slide at the time. It was okay. Uh, it's not actually displaying because uh, it looks like uh, it looks like my, my system has run out of memory to uh, display that. Um, but it's a global heat map of the NSA surveillance, right? This was an interactive tool uh, inside the agency that said where we are collecting the most communications, right? Where we're ingesting the most emails, the most phone calls into our systems, right? Text messages, uh, your internet traffic, Google searches, things like that. Um, and it showed that we were actually collecting more American communications than we were Russian communications. Uh, and I asked them, you know, is this what we signed up for? Uh, is this what we were trying to achieve? Uh, and of course they said, no, you know, that doesn't seem right. That's not really accurate. But they said, hey, look, you know what happens to people who rock the boat. Uh, and they specifically referenced uh, people like uh, Thomas Drake, of course, who was a, a very famous case in this example. Uh, but the idea here is that, yes, every whistleblower uh, learns from the individuals who came before. Uh, I would not have been possible without the examples uh, of Daniel Ellsberg, of William Binney, uh, of Thomas Drake, of Chelsea Manning. Uh, because it is this iterative understanding of our history, how the government operates, how they are likely to respond, how you interact successfully with journalists and unsuccessfully, uh, that informs your thinking, your method of operation, and your belief that change can be achieved. And I'm so thankful for these people who, who came before because they showed that, yes, the NSA will retaliate. Uh, the United States government will retaliate, uh, regardless of whether it's right or wrong, regardless of whether they have any grounds or belief. Uh, I knew I would be charged with the Espionage Act, despite the fact that I was not a spy. I wasn't contacting foreign governments. I was contacting journalists because this is what they did to Thomas Drake, uh, who uh, did the same thing. The government, uh, this was a senior NSA executive, for those who are not familiar, uh, at the very top levels of the agency in the wake of 9-11, who discovered the warrantless wiretapping program uh, and a privacy-preserving equivalent program that the NSA killed. Uh, and because they suspected him of telling the media about these programs, even though he went through proper channels, he went to the inspector generals, he went to his supervisors, uh, he went to the lawyers to ask them sort of what was going on. Uh, 
they destroyed him in retaliation. They didn't go, look, he went through the process. He did the right thing. He went to Congress to tell them about what was going on. They said, let's indict him as a spy under the Espionage Act. So he is prohibited from telling the jury why he did what he did. The Espionage Act is one of the few laws in the United States uh, that guarantees you cannot receive a fair trial, and it's designed that way intentionally. Uh, that's kind of uh, a feature, not a bug. Um, and if I had not seen that, I may have, may have made less wise decisions. Hello, can you hear me? I can now, thank you. Okay, so my name is Cesar Rizer. I'm actually from Brazil. I'm living here in Canada for six years, and I have a curious question for you. Uh, in the facts revealed back in 2013 by Glenn Greenwald, who is currently living in Brazil, Brazil was one of the countries and governments that was being spied by the NSA. Recently, in Brazil, a massive corruption scandal involving the petroleum company led to a mass massive protest and the impeachment of the president, Dilma Rousseff, without being yet directly involved in this scandal. Do you believe that the USA uses this technology to drive minor democracies and people who vote to empower governors that will benefit them? <laughs> so this is a foreign policy question, right? Uh, more so than an intelligence question. Uh, but it, 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 does, it does have a nexus, it, it does connect. But the answer here is, when we think about that example we just saw, right, where all of these independent commissions looked at these mass surveillance programs and they found that they had no benefit for counterterrorism, you have to think, the NSA has a lot of really smart people working there. They have a lot of very sophisticated uh, top-level officials and low-level uh, employees, the line workers. So why are they running this program if it doesn't benefit counterterrorism operations? And of course, the uh, logical presumption would be, well, it must have benefits somewhere else. And this is the real story of mass surveillance. Mass surveillance has never been established as effective for counterterrorism, right? These laws are always passed saying they'll be used against terrorists. But the reality is they're used for other things. These programs were never about terrorism. They're about power. And when you think about these capabilities, when you think about all the things that they're doing, when you think about what these intelligence agencies do all day, uh, there aren't that many terrorists uh, who are meaningful, who represent a, a real threat. Uh, and they have all of these specialists who work in other areas. What do you think these folks are doing all day? Why do you think these intelligence agencies exist if not to apply these capabilities for what these officials consider to be the national interest? Thank you very much. Okay. So, we have time for uh, two more questions, and what I'm going to do is have uh, the gentleman here on the right uh, ask a question. And now, and I was going to say we'll have one of the women come forward, which we had to do that with a Glenn Greenwald talk as well. So, why don't we start with you, um, the woman in the gray? Yeah, come on forward. Hi, can you hear me? I can. First of all, thank you so much for staying up and taking the time to talk to us. Sorry. <laughs> it's my pleasure. You guys have been waiting a long time. Uh, my question is mostly because most of the people that are in the room and in the line and watching from the live stream are students uh, here in Montreal. And my question is basically what your vision is in terms of us moving forward and protecting civil liberties and our freedoms and democracies. And then what are the tangible things that youth today can do to minimize the risks? especially because we're the generation that's most connected and that clicks, I agree to the terms and conditions faster than. <laughs> yeah, anyway, that's my question. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you know, the main thing is that you guys are already doing uh, what so many people have not uh, in a visible way, right? You, you saw that line outside uh, to talk about surveillance. The first thing, and I think one of the most central things you can do, is all of these politicians like to create uh, an appearance that no one cares about privacy, that no one cares that they're being watched. Uh, but we know this is not the case. You all are here establishing that this is not the case. So the very first thing that you should do is argue 
whenever anybody brings that stuff forward, whenever anybody comes up with that argument saying, you know, I don't care because I've got nothing to hide, go, wait, 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 wait. Privacy isn't about something to hide. Privacy is about something to protect. It's about protecting your rights. It's about protecting your sense of self. It's about protecting an open and liberal society, a free society where you can be who you want, where you can think what you want, where you can have a private conversation between friends, between confidants, where you can figure out what it is that you actually believe in. Privacy is the fountainhead of all other rights. It is the basis from which the other rights derive their meaning, their value. Freedom of speech doesn't mean very much if you can't figure out what it is that you actually want to say and instead have to repeat what other people say, what's popular, because that's the only thing that's safe to say. Right? If you can immediately be separated and prejudged because you are different, right? Uh, that's what privacy is about. Privacy is the right to the self. Privacy is the right to be you. Uh, and this is, you know, coded all the way in our language when you go down to, uh, you know, private property, right? Uh, this is not popular with, uh, you know, in uh, very far to the left. Um, but the idea here is that privacy is the ability to have something for yourself, whether it's a home, whether it's a car, whether it's a pencil, whether it is an idea, whether it is a belief, right? So when somebody says, I don't care uh, about privacy because I've got nothing to hide. That's like saying that I don't care about free speech because I have nothing to say. It's not about you. It's about everyone. It's about all of us. It's about potential. It's about possibility. It's about the foundation of everything that we believe in that so many people have fought and died for. And if you're not willing to stand up for your own right to be you, why do you care? about what happens. All you're saying is that I'm willing to let everyone else decide everything that affects my life. I'm willing to let other people decide my future because I don't have any ideas of my own. Great question, a great answer, and we'll turn it over for one last question. Uh, hi, Edward. My name is Tristano. Um, this question sort of follows from the last one. Uh, you said earlier that surveillance technologies have outpaced democratic controls. What tools do you think you can build to either improve these democratic controls or more, more specifically tools to empower people in the face of government's lack of transparency, like software or otherwise? So this is a great question. We could talk about this for hours. Uh, unfortunately, we, we don't have it. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to make it quick. Uh, let's take a, a little trip down recent memory uh, to see if we can contextualize this for people who aren't so familiar. Wake of 2013, uh, the President of the United States trying to push back against the uh, belief uh, and public presentation that the NSA was conducting mass surveillance, tried to contextualize things by saying, well, we're not actually reading everybody's emails. We're not actually listening to everybody's phone calls. Uh, we're just collecting them in case they're interesting later. Uh, we're just putting them in a bucket. We're just rifling through them. We're not actually scanning them. You know, we just want the safety measure. We don't want to miss anything. Uh, he's also talking about the distinction between metadata versus content. Uh, metadata, uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, the content of communications is what you're actually saying on the phone call what you're actually writing in the body of the email, uh, what you actually write inside the Facebook message. Metadata is one step out from that, and it has no meaningful legal protections in our current uh, Western jurisprudence, which is the real danger, uh, because the government holds that you don't actually own records of your activities, right? You only have a privacy interest in actually what you say, but not anything that anybody records about when you said it, how you said it, how long it took you to say it, things like that. So when we talk about that old school surveillance, right, that used to be targeted, you'd send a private eye to follow people around. Uh, 
And they would see these people leave their homes in the morning. They would write down what time of day they got up, where they left, the means of conveyance. They went in this car, it had this license plate number. This is metadata. Uh, no legal protections for it. You'd go to the cafe, you'd meet with someone. They couldn't sit so close to you that they heard everything you said because you'd go, who is this weirdo following me around? But they'd sit near enough to see who you met with, how long you were there, you know, uh, and be able to sort of assess the context uh, of that relationship. Is this someone that he meets with all the time? Uh, is this a lover? Is this a spouse? You can tell by the frequency of contact. You can tell by, do they spend the night with each other all the time? And, and these things like that. Now they're doing that instantly for everyone always because it's cheap, it's easy, it's free. By following your cell phones, right? Uh, where does your cell phone go at night? What other cell phones are around that cell phone? The uh, laptop that you're using, right? What networks does it connect to? Every network adapter, right? Whether it's the Wi-Fi card, whether it's the Ethernet port, whether it's the radio in your phone, has what's called a UUID uh, or a, a GUID, uh, universally unique identifier or globally unique identifier, right? These you can think of them as little tags that are burned into the hardware of the device. They can't be changed on a permanent basis, uh, at least without serious expertise. Uh, and this means that every time you connect to one of these networks, your device is different from every other device in the world that could be connected to it. Uh, there are meaningful technical reasons for this to happen, right? This wasn't a surveillance scheme, but a byproduct of this is that suddenly the devices that were designed to empower you can now be used to disempower you. They can be used to make you vulnerable. They can be used to watch you. And that is what's happening. Metadata in bulk, this collection that's happening with everyone, and no court needs to be involved because, again, uh, they say you don't own these records. Facebook owns these records. The cell phone company owns this record of where your cell phone went, not you, right? Uh, so they can do whatever they want with it. They can hand it to the government voluntarily. They can provide it in response to a subpoena or a court order, which is not so objectionable, right? Companies can turn over things uh, if the court says we have probable cause to believe this person's a criminal. But what if they do it for everyone all the time, everywhere? What if the government cuts out the middleman and starts doing it themselves by tapping the uh, cross-border fiber optic communications that connect, for example, Canada to the United States or other countries? Well, the problem is the internet doesn't live in Canada, right? The internet lives all over the world. So the minute your communications go uh, to Facebook or Google or Yahoo or anything like this, any major service that anybody's using, you know, uh, you go to iTunes, that's creating a record that these people now didn't have to go to court to uh, have on you. Now, so uh, again, we started to deviate, but again, it's a complex question. I apologize for taking so long. So Obama's going, well, we're not reading the content. And that's because he didn't want to have that conversation where he goes, but we are tracking basically everything else. Uh, when you have enough metadata, you don't need the content. Metadata is a proxy for content because machines can analyze it uh, in a way that content can't. Uh, metadata is, creates perfect records of private lives. Uh, now, even if you believed him, it turned out that was not true. He said, we're not rifling through people's emails, but we found out just last month that in fact Yahoo, one of the major internet uh, companies, uh, had decided beyond what the law required uh, that they would scan all of their customers' emails on behalf of U.S. intelligence. Now, they could have contested this in court, but they chose not to because they thought it would be secret and that nobody would find out. Uh, this is a danger of having companies that store enormous amounts of data on their customers. If you build it, they will come. Now, let's contrast that to uh, a messenger, uh, an app, right, uh, for your smartphone called Signal. Uh, it's on iOS, it's on Android. Uh, it allows you to make encrypted calls, send encrypted texts to avoid this kind of thing, right? If you want to send uh, photos to somebody uh, and you don't want uh, the Canadian government or anybody else to see it, uh, even just your internet service provider, you've got to encrypt it. Well, the FBI came after them saying, we want to know uh, what one of your users is doing. Uh, signal went instead to a civil liberties organization, the ACLU, and they fought in court what they could. They found out that they couldn't resist the order, which is okay, you know, they've got no legal recourse there. But they said, what if we fight the secrecy order? What if we fight for the right to tell people that it happened? And there they won. And here's where it gets interesting. 
They did cooperate with the FBI. They had to. They had no legal choice. But because of the design of their service, this is the actual records, all of the records, that they handed over to the FBI. Uh, the government redacted it, but we know based on the uh, operation what it was. The account number on the left is the phone number that the government already had because the government said, you know, we want you to look up this number. And the only information that this company held was when the account was created, the date, and the last time that it connected because they weren't tracking who you were calling with this. They weren't tracking what you were doing with this because it wasn't necessary for the operations of their business. This gives us an idea, a framework of a safer world, particularly for journalists and individuals uh, uh, who have uh, a real need, right? Not just uh, a rights-based need, but a professional need, uh, perhaps a safety-based need. Because if you're a journalist in Beijing or Moscow or somewhere else, uh, and the government can see who you're contacting, that could actually get people jailed, killed, or worse. Uh, we need to move to a paradigm where all of our communications are encrypted by default. Now, what does encryption mean? Um, for, for those who don't understand that mass surveillance problem with the metadata that we talked about earlier, uh, the problem is when you think about the internet, how it actually works, how it fits together, when you send a text message, uh, when you send a Facebook message, how does that actually get from your phone to the other person's phone, right? Well, it's got to travel over this no man's land of the internet. All of these systems that are physically connected, right? The fiber optic cables, the satellite links, all the radio hops, the microwave uh, connections. Uh, you don't see any of this, it just happens, right? But it's there. And all of those people in the middle have a chance to look at that communication. Uh, if it's an SMS, right, a normal text message that you send, it's completely unencrypted. Anybody in the middle can read what it is, they can store what it is, they can save what it is. Uh, the same thing for normal emails that are sent unencrypted, uh, web traffic that's not HTTPS at the front of the bar, right? That's just HTTP, that's unencrypted, so anybody can see that. Uh, but if you encrypt it now, suddenly all they have is the metadata. They can't actually read that interior transmission. Uh, what this means is that governments have been exploiting this property to collect all of that stuff for free as your communications cross the internet electronically naked. Encryption allows us to armor our communications to walk through that dangerous valley and get to the other side with some dignity left intact. Uh, that's the first thing that we need to establish to protect the content of our communications. The second thing, which is a much more difficult problem, and maybe because you're students, you can research this problem and find a way to fix it permanently, uh, is how do we protect the fact that the communication occurred at all in the first place, the metadata, right? There's what you said, and then there's also the fact that you said something at all. Can we protect the fact that you called your mother, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your professor, whatever, you called uh, a hospital, uh, you called an abortion clinic, you called a political group, you called a church, uh, any connection, where you spend your money, how you do it, where you travel, when you cross a border. Right now, we are living lives of unparalleled vulnerability to power. We live in a very safe time. Let's make no mistake about that, right? Everybody plays up the threat of terrorism. But if you look at any metric of mortality, uh, if you look at any metric of quality of life, we're doing pretty good uh, relative to historic circumstances. Yet at the same time, uh, our ability to resist uh, powerful institutions, be they corporate, be they governmental, has never been less than it is today. Because their powers throughout history have been very closely uh, connected to ours, right? Uh, when people only had muskets, uh, the government had to be pretty careful. Uh, when people only had horses, there was only so much they could do. Uh, when you have one side that has the largest surveillance machine that has ever been completed on a global basis in the history of humanity, and they have the exclusive use of it, and we, on the other hand, have smartphones that are saying everywhere we go all the time, every purchase we make, every website we visit, we need to think about what that means. It means we are creating permanent records of our daily activities that could be used for purposes that we will never know and have no say in. We have an obligation 
And we have a right to change the game and say, yes, if governments, if courts want to monitor criminals, they can do so. Uh, they can go to a judge. They can say, this is the evidence that we need to monitor this individual. But the days where they could monitor everyone, everywhere, all the time, simply what the government calls uh, by means of bulk collection, which is the government euphemism for mass surveillance, they say, we just want to collect everything and store it in case we want to uh, search it later. Those days are numbered. We are going to move towards a freer and fairer future rather than simply the one that has already been laid out for us. We are at a decision point, and we could have a very dark future or a very bright future, but the ultimate determination of which fork in the road we take won't be my decision. Uh, it won't be the government's decision. It will be your generation's decision. And I'm looking forward to seeing what it is that you guys actually decide. This is a perfect um, note and place to end from dystopian realism of the present to possible utopia of the future. And what I'd like to do is actually first thank the Beaverbrook Foundation uh, for making this possible. And I'd also like to thank Snowden and um, the audience. And everyone is standing up right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your patience tonight. I know we had some difficulties, uh, both in getting everybody in the room, getting the technology working. Uh, but this is an example of how, you know, if we have a little bit of patience, if we deal with a little bit of inconvenience, we can make things happen. And so thank you so much. And I hope that next year, I hope that next year I'll be able to see you in person. Thank you. Thanks, Seth.